Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by BW Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. Tim Marcinowski is the founder and CEO of Yeti Cloud and is working to make the IT service desk non-existent. Tim shares how his father was his sole cheerleader, and he also sheds light on how he is now propelling his dreams forward with an IT infrastructure. During his teenage and early adulthood years, there are many paths to go down, both positive and negative, but Tim's father helped him stay on the right path, made him feel his ideas belonged, and assured him that his efforts were worthwhile. And those are the people that we all need in life. Tim then goes into his proudest moment of buying a home for his family and how his story continues to progress. Getting to know Tim, he is one of those guys who strips away the material side of life. He values people for who they are and what they represent, not how much they have. I look forward to hearing your thoughts with Tim Marcinowski. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the One Away Show. I'm here with Tim Marcinowski, who's the founder and CEO of Yeti Cloud. Tim is a software engineer who recently left Capital One's Tech Fellow program to make IT service desks non-existent. Tim has over 10 years of experience in large-scale operations, product, and open source communities. Before founding Yeti Cloud, he worked for Puppet, FINRA, and the U.S. Navy. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. Absolutely. So, Tim, we're going to dive in to the, your one away uh, experiences. And for you, uh, that person that we're gonna discuss today is your father. So I would love to know a little bit about your father and how he uh, supported like the, some of the, the, how he has supported some of the decisions I have to find you. Yeah, so my father, um, most of his life was an entrepreneur. Uh, where we had our family video store. Um, So when I was growing up in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, before Blockbuster hit our hometown, uh, we had a couple of video stores and I got to grow up interacting with customers. And uh, my dad hadn't been a, you know, highly successful entrepreneur, but a local business owner um, that I really respected growing up. Uh, he was a very, he was a very tough father, uh, you know, having raised four sons, uh, you know, and I'm pretty much sitting in the middle. Uh, it was very uh, frustrating for him to obviously, you know, raise us and have the business. And my mom also worked a second job. Uh, but the reason why I respected him the most was because growing up, there was a lot of, you know, negativity and, and sort of like so many paths that you can go forward in your life and to make something happen. My father was basically my, my sole uh, cheerleader kind of growing up and uh, advocate for what I was doing at the time with IT and sort of propelling forward, you know, in the Navy and after the Navy dealing with a lot of different types of applications and infrastructure for many different companies. And, you know, he's always been there for me going through that growing pains as a teenager in my early adulthood. Yeah, absolutely. So did your father, did he push you down the path into the technical route? How much of the video store had a technical component and your early days were motivated by the experiences you had in the video store? Yeah, great question. So during the video store times in the late 80s and early 90s, our video store called Fast Forward Video was one of the only businesses in our county that actually had a computer. So instead of doing your regular bookkeeping, accounting, uh, when people took out rentals, a lot of that that was done on um, essentially uh, little paper make cards or some sort of archaic you know, tracking system. And you know, being one of the first computer owners in our county for our, running our business, um, that's sort of where I got my introduction into interacting with you know MS DOS and early Microsoft Microsoft technologies and the big 
uh, five and a quarter floppy disks. So that's where uh, technology kind of started out for me in the video store was just playing Wheel of Fortune on our uh, <laughs> company computer. Absolutely. And, you know, something that uh, I've seen is, is a lot of people kind of fall into these, uh, who they are and their trajectories. I think of something I'm so passionate about storytelling is, is I grew up writing journals because my mom had me in therapy from a yeah. divorce, right? But today it's a big part of my work in helping people craft that. So it's neat how uh, that work with your father launched you into what you're doing now uh, and, and put you in your path. You, you said, Tim, uh, in, in some of the notes before the call that nobody really cared or supported you uh, in what you wanted to do, but your father did. And so I'm curious, what did your dad do that, like, what did he do that made you feel so supported and that you belonged and, and your ideas were worthwhile? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is before, you know, the dot-com era and a lot of people didn't understand what a personal computer really is or the power behind it. So oftentimes, whether it was other family members or friends, you know, I'm spending a lot of time playing on the computer or thinking I'm playing like video games or something. And it's not quantifiable to, hey, how is Tim not going to grow up and be a bum playing with computers, right? Same argument for video games. And now a lot of esports players are, are millionaires playing video games. Uh, so there was just that lack of understanding in that time period before the dot com boom that parents and other people didn't know that you can make, you know, a lucrative business or just make a lucrative income, you know, just writing software for computers or just helping people fix them or maintain them. And at the time, you know, nobody really understood how big personal computing would be even, even in the late eighties and early nineties, which seems pretty, you know, still kind of ahead of where Apple II computers were in the early eighties and people, still didn't know where personal computers could potentially go until the iPhone was released um, from Steve Jobs' big famous keynote. Absolutely. And more specifically, right, I, I think when we have these people in, in, in our lives, for you, that was your father who supported you along this journey. Did he have any, uh, do you, are there any vivid stories or memories where he came and said, Tim, I am fully behind what you're doing, or I am extremely proud of you. What, what maybe moments do you remember from growing up where you felt I can be completely safe around my dad to pursue the things in my life that I'm closest to? Yeah. So, you know, growing up, um, my father supported me, but he was still very tough. You know, he wasn't right off the boat like our grandparents. So there was a lot of that Polish uh, in German heritage where very strict, very, you know, you're hoarding stuff because you never know what's going to happen. Um, and so he was a very tough father. And really the, the moment for me where I can, where I knew that he 110 percent supported me and was proud of me was when I got my first offer letter outside of the Navy, um, for working at General Dynamics. <clears throat> at the time I had gotten an offer letter for 65 K which is a huge deal for back home when the average household income is 28K in a small coal region town. So my father, you know, after seeing that, you know, I, coming from playing with computers to, you know, doing my four years in the Navy with IT and engineering resources to now landing my first job two months outside of the Navy, making 65K a year, it was, you know, for him, it was that proud sudden moment where it was like, hey, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the greatest father and always there, but the, you know, the, the amount of support that he gave me was enough to get me to the point in my life, you know, where I had gotten to. So that was right. a big moment for me and for him yeah. also. Yeah, absolutely. It's all, so as I'm kind of tracking this qualitative data, it's this consumption in the video store pushed you down the technical route in a offer letter years or decades later that enabled you to buy the first house for your parents. What, what did that moment feel like when you were able to do that? What, what was the, beyond kind of sensing your parents being proud, what did that feel like for you? You know, it gave me a sense of freedom. Uh, I had always told myself that, you know, what good, what good is having things if you don't share them with your friends, right? And I think, you know, a friend once told me that, and I've always applied that to my life after the age of 23. And it made me reflect and really think about like, hey, my parents gave me as much as they could growing up. How can I give back? And so my mission to give back in my 20s was 
my mom had a house that was okay, uh, but was falling apart. Um, and I had a lot of old bad memories. And so for me, after purchasing my parents a house, it really gave me that sense of like freedom in this, that I can go and do anything from now on. And I've kind of cleared my conscience, uh, you know, cause I felt bad that my parents gave me everything and I, and I hadn't given them anything back. And that was sort of my give back was getting them that house. Wow. Well, I, I'm not there yet in my, uh, personal career, but I, I know the feeling of what it's like when parents support you, uh, after kind of going your own way for a while. And, and that is, it's the greatest feeling in the world and what that I think can catapult you to do after. So you mentioned that, you know, this moment where, you know, you bought your parents a house, uh, it completely changed maybe what you thought was possible for yourself. So how, what's gone on internally inside, you know, your own mind that, you know, this moment has brought to you in the sense of, I can go take on this next thing, or I can go achieve this. What, what's that been like for you since you were able to purchase their home? I mean, really, it's kind of like Wild Wild West, you know, some days I wake up and I'm feeling <clears throat> I'm ready to go get it. And then other times it's like, hey, you know, in my life, I've done all these things and I've provided for my family. It's time for me to also relax. So there's that internal struggle of, you know, what this particular venture is staying motivated. Uh, and I think every every founder has, has a small subset of that struggle. Um, but over the last year and a half, you know, it took me the first six months just to really kind of tell myself, hey, you need to take this seriously. Um, I know you just bought your parents a house and I know that you want to start this venture, but, you know, you can't give up just because you fulfilled this lifelong goal. Um, now it's time to double down and really make this venture something that's long and lasting and we can provide value to our customers. Yeah, absolutely. And what, you know, for, for the audience's context, what, what is that venture that this experience pushed you towards into building and leaving your job at Capital One to do? Yeah, you know, it's just it, from a technical founder, a lot of times we get really obsessed and really crazed about the problem that we're trying to solve. And so when I was at Capital One and even before that, working at a, at a, at a market leader, at a vendor um, who offered IT automation solutions, was that there wasn't enough vendors or products out there solving these core problems, like why companies' infrastructure and applications go down constantly and how they invest so much money in the tools and technology and people. And they don't, they don't necessarily get the benefits out of those vendors or tools that solve their core problems. And so just solving that problem for me was enough to say, hey, I'll put my personal capital to work and go and solve this problem. And if we're able to make new friends along the way and make a buck. That's all great. And then if it doesn't work out in two to three years, then, you know, I have a really awesome story and I met a lot of great people and hopefully my next venture down the road, uh, we can do business with like minds that we've, you know, either connected with or continue to connect with in our, in our outside of our networks. Absolutely. I think that uh, is a good strategy. And, you know, one, and something I relate with from my first venture and uh, you know, I think you're well on your way, uh, but not to go too deep on the business front. I think there's something really interesting in, in your story, Tim. It's, it's you kind of gained from my, from the outside looking in all this confidence from, from again, let's go back to that central moment of buying your parents' house. I can do anything type of feeling. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I can do anything. I can start a business. I can build something that I think could be very successful, but that ex in the process of that, you were let go from Capital One for making the decision. You were seen as a threat. What what did that feel like? What kind of emotion? That, how did that process go down? And and do you do you re regret anything along the way? Oh, so yeah, one of my so yeah, you touched on uh, one time being let go. That was actually for my first venture several years ago. Uh, not a capital one, but uh, yes. So, you know, when you're, when you're fired for coming off of something that can be competitive with a particular line of business or product, or even a feature of a product, um, that's kind of what really set me, set, really motivated me years ago to start my first venture was, Hey, you know, obviously we're onto something, you know, my partners at the time and, and myself, and so it was like, hey, here's another moment. Let's double down. You know, obviously these guys were scared of the progress and, and sort of the company that we were creating. 
Um, you know, we were just like most people who leave their jobs are either unhappy with their manager or their current workplace, whether it's the environment or culture. And, you know, we, we were, we wanted to build a better culture, a better environment for people. Um, but, you know, unfortunately it never came to be as big as the vision that we had, but, you know, we had to take that leap of faith and we had to double down, you know, when I was in that sort of, I wouldn't really call an exit interview. I'd call it more of like just a, just a firing. They asked us, they said, you know, we love the work that you guys do. We'd love to keep you around, but you'd have to dissolve the business. And for us, that was like, no, like, why would we dissolve the business? Like, we're not even talking to your customers. We're not even in the same market segment. We're not even targeting the same type of buyers or personas that you guys are. You know, we're primarily focused on the SMB market, which are usually underserved uh, customers. And, you know, we just continue to just say, hey, let's stick to our guns. Absolutely. I uh, can respect that a lot. And, uh, you know, well, I, I think there's a lot of the lessons in that and it pushed you, uh, you know, in the face of resilience. Uh, let's, let's go back to your father, this person who's, you know, you, you say, I didn't teach you too many things, but he gave you a couple of valuable things that will be stuck with you for the rest of your life. Uh, your, your dad taught you how to listen. And you talk about this being a tool that uh, is more valuable than many things that you have at your disposal. What, how, what made your father such a good listener and how did you adopt those, you know, how did you adopt your own ability to listen into your life? Yeah, it's a really great question. You know, my father didn't have much to give, you know, supporting us growing up as far as, you know, financially, uh, we didn't have the new issues on the, on the blocks, but really when I reflected, you know, in my twenties, why my father was so impactful to, you know, my work that I was doing and why it was so motivating. And I really thought about like how good of a listener he is and everybody that we meet typically talk, 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 or there's always them trying to one up or share a story. When you get in that cadence, you, you know, you get used to it and you just kind of put it off. Um, but when you really reflect on the people that care, most of the time they listen very deeply and they're not saying, yeah, or okay. After every sentence, there's somebody who just, just listens and you could just dump whatever on them. Uh, and that's such a valuable skill. And it really, I didn't, I didn't learn from that skill until I was probably about 24, 25 when I stopped being as arrogant um, personally and started doing a lot of reflection on, Hey, how can I be a better person? Um, not just to myself, but, you know, potential people that I'm either working with or employ. Um, and that's a quality that, that has stuck with me ever since. And I, I, I listen, you know, I try to deploy listening every day and I constantly remind myself, hey, stop talking, just listen. Well, you know, I feel that similar to you, Tim, I think one of the things when I first met you was we just connected and yes, we connected over community and people and bringing people together, but there was a, a vibe, I think, about you that it was it was easy to connect to you because there was this nurturing kind of listening component to who you were and I think it doesn't come across of a, as aggressive and I think you can be the the biggest hustler in the world and have the greatest ambitions but if you don't have kind of emotional tact to how you come across uh, it can it can be a turnoff it, it kind of smells really thick and heavy and people don't want to be around it and I think <laughs> that characteristic about you is, is very appealing and something I really admire about you and, and just because men in business not trying to stereotype that's not too common you find that yeah there's definitely a lot of people who try to push push forward and I mean I get it you can get a far way pushing forward and you get a far way talking people's ears off but that gets to a certain point where people don't want to pull the trigger on you know why would they want to do a transaction with you why would they want to build a long lasting relationship with you. For example, why would they want to spend um, at the beach together with both of your families, you know, and there's a certain point where you, you can't build a relationship by pushing forward and by talking your way in or out of a situation um, really it comes down to do you, would you want to work with this person or would, or do you look at this person as somebody that could potentially be your boss and respect. Um, and that kind of comes to listening, right? Cause at the end of the day, we all want to be heard. Um, and the people that want to talk the most are usually people that are either underserved or they just, 
they don't have somebody who can sit there and listen and it goes along with it. Absolutely. I think that's a great perspective. Uh, let's, let's go back to your father uh, and keep kind of pinning back there. What, you know, he taught you so much. Uh, he gave you a kind of a hope for yourself uh, and confidence to pursue the things that you have done. What, what's, uh, maybe some defining experiences about this person um, that maybe you look back the way you were raised or how you grew up and said, if my dad didn't do blank, I want to be blank. Yeah, I would say, I would definitely say, you know, if my father wasn't as hard on me, um, and I'm not saying hard as in like pushing me forward with my goals, but hard on me as making sure I stay committed with myself. And what I mean by that with myself is, you know, when I'm talking about what I want to do, you know, when I'm in the ninth grade and it's easy for a parent to say, yeah, yeah, it sounds great. You should go do that. <laughs> it's very easy to get in that group. Um, my father wouldn't even say that. Uh, it was very silent. It was very, sounds good. I'm here. If you need me, um, let me know if there's anything I can do. That's, that's very powerful. If I didn't have that, um, type of tune and and type of let me figure it out on my own don't push me too hard but keep myself accountable for what I'm saying um, is very powerful and if I didn't have that I probably would have just said a thousand things that I wanted to do in life and never really stuck with one thing or I would have been a jack of all trades and it would have taken me a lot longer to figure out who I am or or the passion in my life that I found um, solving these these problems for organizations. Absolutely. That's, uh, you know, really neat. I have my mom similar. Uh, she always supported me uh, with what I wanted to do. And I think she didn't push me too hard to go do it. She, but she found the resources to help me get there, whether that was a coach, whether that was whatever it was. And I, that is motivating because you don't feel this. You're not going to be good enough for your parents. You just feel you have parents behind you, but I think part of being a kid and growing up is you want to please, at least I did, you know, and, and impress because they're giving you an opportunity and you want to make the most of that. And so uh, it's really neat that your dad was able to create that environment for you because I'm sure in the professional setting, personal setting, if you have kids down the road, you're going to instill maybe some of those same qualities into how you raise a kid or how you manage a team. So uh, that is, uh, really neat. I've never heard it put like that. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, let's, uh, let's maybe wrap up here. Uh, what? So how what would you encourage? Let's, let's put it like this. What if if you could give advice to someone in their mid 20s or a kid in their high schools, uh, and how to foster a relationship with uh, someone they look up to and to develop a more long-term relationship. What would you give them advice to go do? And how would you uh, suggest they start that conversation? Yes, that's a tough question. A uh, very tough question for me. Um, I typically don't like giving advice just because um, most people, they need to self-discover um, thing for them. Uh, everybody is everybody's different in the sense of what really works for them. There's a lot of formulas and there's a lot of tricks and stuff. But the biggest thing I could say, you know, especially as someone younger, is if there's one thing that you're passionate about, it could be something as stupid as um, collecting model trains. I mean, something that just, you're just like, people make fun of me or people look at me differently. I would say whatever that thing you're passionate about, it doesn't matter what it is, you should double down and you should stick with it and stick with it for more than 10 years. Because anything, anything of value that you build personally typically comes from building something from over 10 years, over a decade that you spend nurturing something and seeing it come to light um, and sticking with it and not giving up because of somebody's, somebody says something or somebody thinks it's stupid or it doesn't fit in the world how it works today. Um, just stick with it. People don't understand it. And don't spend your time trying to demystify it for them either. They don't get it. That's fine. Let them move on. 
but there will be a time in your life where you'll find that niche group of people or, you know, people who believe in what you're doing and want to get behind you. But, but that only happens if you commit and make it something and you invest the time over 10 years in something, whether it's a career path, whether it's a hobby or even a side hustle that you're doing. People could, people could tell right away if you're serious or if you're committed to something. And if you're really passionate and you show it, people want to work with you, whether or not the problem and solution matches, people just still want to be around you and, f- and feed off your energy because a lot of times people miss those opportunities in life and are looking to really work with you because you have that energy and that focus and determination for the thing that somebody at one time called stupid or didn't quite understand. It. Um, so that would be advice that I would give for somebody younger is be, be ready to commit 10 plus years to something that you're very passionate about. That's awesome. I, um, you know, I, I, they, they say when you're, you're talking to someone and you get goosebumps, right? It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's also, I feel, and I think when we're creating content that creates goosebumps, it's not just doing it for you and me, right? It's, it's doing it for the people who are going to listen and, and kind of take part in this audio video experience. Uh, and, and I, I, I mean, that strikes a chord uh, in, a, in a big way. Uh, so Tim, uh, to close, where can people find you? What's, what's the one liner for why uh, a corporation should use Yeti Cloud and how should someone reach out to you? Yeah, so I, I have an office here and uh, we work Tyson's Corner in uh, Northern Virginia. So I'm typically here half the week if I'm not grabbing coffee or lunches with somebody. Um, I'm typically spending most of my time on LinkedIn. Um, not so much on other social platforms, um, just because the people that I want to work with and connect with are typically on LinkedIn, and that's where you can find me. And for companies that are looking to work with us, especially larger enterprises, I mean, at the end of the day, these companies you know, don't care how their IT problems get fixed. They only care that they do get fixed and they get fixed right away. And we're the only solution on the market today that addresses those complexities and issues in real time. And so per, hopefully we can prevent these outages before they happen, but if not, at least we can fix them as soon as possible for the users. And so any company that believes in that, uh, we should definitely talk and work together. Incredible. Well, that's Tim Marcinowski, the guy who's been behind computer technology for more than two decades. So if you've been listening, uh, this guy is, uh, he has what it takes to make, make, make it happen. So Tim, thanks again for being so raw, vulnerable, real uh, with us. And I, I appreciate who you are as a person above all else and, and what you're building. So thanks for coming on. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me and anybody that's listening up until this point. I really appreciate you taking the time out to hear my story. And uh, right. check out Brian's content in the coming weeks. Great stuff. Absolutely. And go check out Tim's LinkedIn. It's, it's really good, I hear. Thanks. Mm-hmm.